All right. So my name is Charles Edge. I wrote that book that I've handed out. Um, today I'm going to talk about just OS 10 security. I guess um, for the most part this might be like synonymous with security for foreign OSs or something of that nature. How many people here use OS 10 server specifically? And how many people use OS 10? So just a couple more. Right on. Yeah, I, I see those uh, Velcroed uh, phone closets all the time these days. Like, where's your FTP server? Oh, it's right there. It's in the <laughs> Velcroed. Um, that's <laughs> but whatever works, right? Um, I'm not going to play my slideshow if that's okay. I, I like to do this so I can switch between apps. Um, someone complained one time that I did that, so hopefully you guys are all right with it. Um, <clears throat> and then before I get started, just a note on what she was talking about before. I'm all for greater transparency at the corporate level for security and stuff. I can't tell you how many companies I come into where if it weren't for SOX, they'd still be running um, SMTP re open relays and all kinds of stupid crap. And I'm just totally all for all that stuff. So just on a side note. Um, all right, so <laughs> um, yeah, security through brute force by the government, I guess, um, for lack of a better word. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, totally no talent, sysadmins running around deploying solutions for 100,000 users bugs the hell out of me. But um, all right, so Mac OS X server, I titled it kind of open source made easy because that's Apple's tagline. Um, back in the day, OS 9, totally easy, kind of difficult to crack just because no one ever played with it. But now it's just a standard old Next distribution, so anything that works in the Next environment is going to work in... OS 10 for the most part, if you can get it to compile. Um, so users that require easy solutions often don't have the skills to secure their own solutions, kind of like with Microsoft's Small Business Server. So whereas Microsoft has, for example, deprecated the use of Small Business Server as a terminal server, um, OS Mac is, they're, they're still, you know, three or four years behind Microsoft in a lot of this stuff, and they haven't done, started to do things like that. So am I making sense so far? All right. Um, and then end users in the Mac community are pretty resistant to basic security concepts because they haven't had to practice those. A lot of times with OS 9, traffic wasn't routable, so people really didn't worry about securing perimeter and stuff like that. You have a question? Or No? All right. All right, so Mac specifics to a standard Nix distro. Um, Apple's really hardcore about plist files. They really like the XML format, so they've been trying to convert .cf and .com files over to plists. Um, they keep everything in a netinfo database, so whereas you won't see .password files or things of that nature, you do see a lot of stuff locked into the netinfo database, which is kind of interesting because later down the road when we start talking about how they've got open LDAP built and stuff like that, they, uh, they lock all this stuff in there so that um, everything is encrypted at a higher rate and stuff like that. So file system is normally not UFS on a Mac OS X server. It's normally OS X extended, which um, Lazarus up in San Francisco can do a lot of recovery stuff for a little better than some of the places down here like drive savers. Um, all the files and apps are in the wrong place. For those of us who have used... Apache, for a long time, if you sit down on an OS X server, you're going to be like, um, where, where's everything at? Or pretty much any other program, for that matter, that Apple decides to implement. They're really good about taking um, co code out of the open source community, and they're getting better about giving code back, but they're not really very good about conforming to kind of the standards of where we put things. So not that it's very difficult to find anything with a locate command or something like that, but you know, just a good point to make. Um, and then server manager, server NGRD, is um, <clears throat> sometimes if you do edit, let's say, the httpd.com file, um, you're going to notice that like your timeout value doesn't actually change. So where are you supposed to actually do that? And a lot of times it's locked inside of netinfo. And rather than be able to edit some of those values directly, you actually have to use the server manager daemon. Does that make sense? Um, and then another difference between the Mac community, um, there's a lot of GUI tools for pretty much anything, including um, chmod, if you can imagine that. So I'm serious. <laughs> like Mac, the Mac community, in fact, I have it installed here to show. <laughs> but batch mod, it's just like a little 
you know, click four boxes and there you go. <laughs> so, and it even does rec it even does recursion for those of you who haven't figured out how to use an R in your command line statements. <laughs> exactly. But, um, but, but you know, with, um, with a lot of this stuff, when, when it starts to get more complicated than like a chmod or, um, or chown, like by building these types of tools with programs like Coco, um, you're kind of sponsoring the deployment of them on a wider scale. For example, I can deploy Henwin or Snort to a client um, and they can manage it even if they're not an IT company because it's got a GUI front end, whereas maybe they wouldn't be able to if it was a command line only tool. So it's kind of, by having GUI apps for a lot of the security tools that we use, it actually sponsors more or um, spurs more in-depth use, I guess, from the client side. So. <clears throat> so entertainment specifics, obviously the Mac is pretty heavily used in the entertainment sphere. Um, I, I kind of subtitled this slide, Know Thy Target. Um, if you're doing penetration testing or security in a Mac environment, um, one of the biggest things is that a lot of them are graphics houses where people don't want to use passwords, or in some cases, according to the application sets that they're using, they actually can't use passwords and things of that nature. So we do a lot of um, physical subnetting or VLANing to get around some of this stuff, but still it's, um, it's great stuff to know about. Um, the users really aren't used to even having passwords, much less having to change them on their own every 90 days or something of that nature. So when you're talking to someone who's been using computers for 20 years and never had a password for logging into their computer, it's kind of hard sometimes to say, okay, well, you need to change it every 30 days so no one brute forces it or something of that nature. So um, especially with those root passwords. <laughs> um, I actually had a situation a couple months ago where a client had their root password on 20 servers as the word root, which I thought was kind of special. Um, and there's lots of open wireless networks in the Mac community. They can't seem to remember the passwords to bandy about and things of that nature. Um, if you're driving through West Hollywood, that's probably one of the easiest places I would guess around to actually do some, uh, some more driving. Um, Users often want to set up their own servers. They walk into the Apple store, some guy in the Apple store talks them into an XServe, they take it home. They still can't figure out why it's only this big, but they put it on the desk, they turn it on, they click start for web server, and they put the files where they go. And that's it. They don't do anything else. And by default, a lot of, uh, I'll cover that later, but a lot of things are enabled that really shouldn't be. They should be explicitly enabled, kind of the way that a lot of other distributions now are doing it, like SE Linux. So. Um, and then, I guess for LDAP as well, you know, any other program, it's just like you click on the start button and it's suddenly an FTP server. Um, and that, that's not always a good thing, you know. Um, so AFP specifically, most of the things that, that I've written, um, as far as exploits go, target AFP because everyone else has already done open LDAP and everyone else has already done Apache. So it makes it for, for a little more... Um, groundbreaking or interesting type stuff, although the same principles that apply to like SMB would apply to AFP. AFP is just what happened to Apple Talk. Um, and and it, it's like Apple Talk with multicast DNS to find other servers and stuff like that. So for those of you who haven't used it, um, AFP by default runs over pi port 548. So if you're actually looking for open servers out there, you can just search for, you know, do a port scan. Um, for port 548. Um, AFP had a known vulnerability that gave root. Most of the vulnerabilities for Apple stuff um, give are, are just straight DOS attacks. Um, specifically, there, there have been three or four now for AFP that actually gave root, and, um, and that was included in Metasploit last year at DEF CON, I guess. Someone demoed that. Um, AFP still has similar vulnerabilities. But um, because of the way Apple patches things like that, they just patch the specific buffer. They don't actually bother to figure out why, why the algorithm was able to, to do that, if that makes sense. So they'll just patch each specific buffer, and then the next one, you can always, like he was talking about earlier, fuzz it and find another one that'll kind of do the same thing. So, um, and then one nice thing about AFP is you can actually run AFP over SSH. It's just a checkbox. They made it nice and easy to do. All you have to do is check that box, and that kind of mitigates that as a, as a possible exploit. So, um, <clears throat> one of the things, like I mentioned just a second ago, Apache with its mods, 
Um, by default, when ah, okay. By default, all these these are the modules that are enabled on an OS 10 server. That when you start up Apache, um, personally, some of these I, I don't I don't think should be enabled. Um, <laughs> the I I don't know what what else to say about that except for. Um, I've yet to see someone who set up an OS X server other than myself as a web server that actually bothered to disable the modules that they weren't using. Um, and a lot of times people will argue back if I do do it, well, what if my developers need to use Jakarta? It's like, well, then let's install a later version of Jakarta than the one that Apple included. You know, um, Like with something like if you're installing a CentOS box with Webmin, you want to keep the everything up to date and, you know, that's not always done by Apple. So, so um, <coughs> SSI, PHP, um, luckily they didn't enable folder listings this revision. And 10.2, by default, folder listings were enabled on every directory. Um, performance cache is turned on by default, which I personally find to be quite, quite annoying when I find a server that's been turned into a phishing server because someone exploited performance caching on it or something like that. So a lot of these things are just kind of, not to use a buzzword, but best practices. You know, you turn off what you're not using. Um, I personally think that by default you should be turning on what you are using rather than turning off what you're not using. But, um, but the MySQL distribution in OS X servers is a little bit old. There aren't any, um, any root attacks for this or anything like that, but there are a lot of DOS attacks. Um, Every client that I've worked on so far that uses MySQL actually also uses PHP MyAdmin. And of those, um, I've only seen maybe two or three that actually bothered to put a password on PHP MyAdmin. So if you're trying to exploit an OS X server, that's always a pretty easy place to look just because the users don't understand and they leave it to the web developers to actually do both the development and the security. And so like HD access type stuff? Right, yeah. Putting a yeah, just doing an HD access realm in OS 10 server. There's actually a feature called Realm, and it'll do all that stuff for you. Um, but I, I I have yet to see yeah the realm. I don't know if I I've got these red dots, so I don't know if it's actually going to show me. But when you go into a site, you can click on realms, and then you can just add a add a realm, which is essentially like a GUI front end for HD access. It just doesn't use HD access yeah. files. I just skip right over that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, no, it's 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 not. Although, you know, when you are logging into an HT access file, a lot of times it does say Realm. Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of easy to correlate what they do. Um, and I cover it in my book. Dot dot dot. Um, <laughs> the realm specifically, um, <clears throat> because a lot of times um, clients will will refuse to troubleshoot with their clients if they're having FTP issues um, and you know, FTP behind NAT. Sometimes you have to step people through enabling or disabling certain checkboxes, which are totally far too difficult to figure out. Um, <laughs> so um, every client that used MySQL that I ran into so far in the field has had the allow network connections turned on. Only maybe two of them needed it. So that's that's kind of another thing to look for. Um, <laughs> um, and then, I'm sorry? Well, just, you know, with, with MySQL, you can disable the ability for any IP other than local host. Yeah, so, and that, in OS X, um, you can't see it. I can grab this screenshot and bring it over here. But it's just a checkbox. So all you'd have to do, literally, is uncheck the box, but no one actually bothers to. So, fun stuff. Um, in other words, they make it really easy to do security audits in Mac environments. Because <laughs> it's like, okay, well, let's figure out why you have 80 open ports for a web server. Um, so post-fix, um, the, there's not really much to say here. Um, it's a st typical post-fix implementation. It does have Clam Assassin and Clam AV already integrated, which makes it kind of easy. You click on Start, you check a box, and you're, you're golden. Um, another nice thing is that they've integrated it with SASL, so your passwords are all stored in secure hashes, um, which is kind of kind of nice. Um, does anyone here work for Apple? <laughs> yeah, right on. <laughs> um, 
shows that they care a lot about their security. Last year, or two years ago at DEF CON when I was speaking and asked that, no one raised their hand either, which is always kind of fun. Um, <laughs> well, you know. They, they, yeah, they ran out of free iPods to give people so that they wouldn't get hurt. Um, so... <laughs> Ah, uh, right. They, it was too far a flight from Cupertino. Um, so Samba, um, it's, it's a slightly older release of Samba. It's, um, it's SMB signing. It's not supported by Apple yet, which apparently they've promised me is going to be changed in Leopard. Um, by default, every sh every SharePoint you create for like AFP or FTP or whatever you're creating a SharePoint for, they enable SMB guest. They or SMB guest access. They enable. SMB even if you don't mean to. And most of the Mac administrators that I know don't think to hit that little drop down box right here where it says when normally that says Apple filing protocol when you first open it and change it to Windows and see if Windows if they're creating SMB SharePoints and FTP SharePoints, both of which have guest enabled. So, you know, you're just kind of an app. And you can disable those globally and kind of mitigate that, but at the same time, you know, you don't really want to be doing that. Um, <coughs> so Sorry? Tell me those are read only by default, right? Uh uh. No, nothing is read only by. I mean, by default, um, by default it's read, read and write for owner, um, read and write for user, and then read only for, for guest, for everyone, yeah. So, right. Um, but, but ever since they integrated ACLs, like I've been seeing a lot of Mac administrators do some pretty pretty retarded things with file permissions, and they'll add like the www user on a on their executive's SharePoint where they're keeping all their financial data or something silly like that, and you're like, what what were you thinking? Um, and their response is usually never mind. Um, <laughs> so um, for Samba, they I, I do think that they've done some nice things. GUI tool-wise, although something like Webmin is going to give a few more features. Um, they've got NTLM v2, NTLM, and Landman all turned on by default. Um, I think that they should just do maybe NTLM v2 and uncheck the other two. I, I guess a lot of this is about like just disabling defaults. And the same is true for a lot of other OSs, but like in Active Directory, they've actually gone the extra step and pseudo-secured the box before you turn it on. You know, password policies are enabled and stuff like that. Whereas in Mac OS X, they haven't really bothered to do that yet. Um, and I, I put this down for Samba, but um, logging is set to low by default. That's true for every module on OS X server. Um, so you actually have to, if you want to get decent logs, turn up the the verbosity, I guess, for lack of a better word, of the of the logging. <coughs> and in some cases, there aren't GUI tools for that. In some cases, there are though. Um, and Samba Connect and OS X Server, as, as all Samba can, I guess, but there's GUI tools to make it just act as a PDC, although there's only like four boxes to fill in for it, so it's not really highly configurable. Um, virtual shares are turned on by default, and every box is a work group master by default. So, um, In CUPS, one, one interesting thing, when you turn on the CUP server and OS X Server, uh, by default it turns on the web front end for CUPS, and there's no password on it. Which is always really nice, you know. Um, and I can't remember off the top of my head. Does anyone else know the pa the port for the for the web front end for Cups? Right. So um, if if I were to <laughs> right, if I were to, if I were to install that right now, I guess you know, uh, if I were to turn it on, you guys would just be able to see it. But by default, um, it, it also listens on all adapters. And the other day, I was at a client who had. Um, for some reason, they had put an airport card in their OS X server, and it was their wireless access point, but it was an open wireless access point. So, I mean, if you can imagine, like, inside your server having an open wireless access point, it's just, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the the level of security stuff and is is pretty amazing in the in the entertainment space, I guess, as far as market share goes. Um, but it makes my job pretty easy, I think. Um, so iChat server, they're definitely using a pretty old version of iChat or of um, Jabber. I don't know if anyone here has implemented Jabber 2.0, but there's a whole lot of new stuff in it, and it's much better, and I think they should update it. But like with almost every other service, they have integrated Jabber with SSL. They just um, don't turn it on by default. I, this, is, um, my, this default SSL certificate is actually something I changed, but um, by default, 
nearly every service is SSL integrated. They just haven't turned them on. Did I say that already? Um, so, and there's there's not really any encryption. So I use personally um, Fire as my Jabber client. I don't know if you guys have used that, but as far as Macs go, it, it does it does support um, in, encrypted uh, message traffic. So, and then Open Directory. Open Directory is Apple's kind of code name for Open LDAP, SASL, um, Kerberos, SlapD, SlurpD. They kind of just threw everything that they could find to make it easy to build something so, kind of like Active Directory together, and called it Open Directory. So. Um, so they do all the integration of that stuff for you. So if you're building like a, an LDAP server, it's just it's pretty pretty simple and straightforward. Um, all usernames and passwords are stored in the NetInfo database. And Leopard, that's going to change. They're they're totally deprecating NetInfo, and they're just going to use SASL for a lot of other stuff than than they have been now. Um, all usernames and or all policies are disabled by default. So by default, there is no lockout on you know three times when you're out for passwords and stuff like that. Which you know you can enable it, but um, but it doesn't work for administrative users, which is always kind of kind of nice. Um, one thing I I didn't think to put on my AFP slide. There's a checkbox that's enabled by default for Masquerade um, for AFP, and what that does is it means you can use any u administrative password with any username. So let's say your user is root, or let's say you, your your user is Bob, you can use the root password to log in as Bob. What? <laughs> um, so if you, if you, you know, that, and this is on OS 10 servers specifically for AFP SharePoints. So um, that, that's always kind of a fun thing when, you know, I guess they put it, they, they put it in there and take it back out every release or so. So if you're running like 10.3.6, it might not be there, but if you're running 10.3.4, 10, it will be. It's, it's like an argument that they have within the development team for OS 10 server as to whether or not it's a good idea. So Mac admins are lazy for the most part, and they don't... Well, I mean, I guess it's for the administrators to be able to troubleshoot permission issues for local for users. I'm right there with you. I think they should just take it out as a feature. Period. Um, even when it's not listed as a checkbox, you can actually enable it using Server Manager. So, but um, but in 10.4.6, it is currently there. And and like I said, they take it out sometimes, put it back. You know, it's it's always um, and it's under the AFP and Server Admin. Anyone cares? Um, so, so that's Open Directory. Um, the next part of Open Directory, I guess, is client management. Um, Apple has implemented kind of Active Directory style client management um, using MCX files, and um, <coughs> this is always fun to blast out to a whole group. The fact that their screens do that <coughs> when they boot up, but um, but never a good idea. Um, <coughs> So the, I guess this is just indicative of them having new policies that they're trying to implement. We did this um, with a couple of different federal agencies that have it where no disks can be inserted in drives and stuff like that. Rather than you know put gum in the drive or whatever, we we just used used this for uh, for roaming profiles and stuff. Um, one thing that's kind of nice about this is you can actually push out file vault and you can push out that every time you say empty trash it does like a secure empty trash or something of that nature so but um but does does that make sense mcx style updates for clients you know control the appearance of clients control the doc control that they can't put usb flash drives in their computers or that the computers won't even boot without you know going into netboot or something like that um <coughs> the the client management it's in it's in Workgroup Manager, um, and it's just under the Preferences button. But it's the, like a limitation. yeah, I mean, instead of issuing policies to clients when they log on, you issue or policy files like .dat files. Um, you're issuing .mcx files that control their environment, and you, you you can customize the mcx files and say, okay, well, if you're running um, Photoshop, you don't have these features or. Um, Right. Yep. Um, it's exactly like like policies. Yeah, like Windows style policies. I mean, it's and you can actually um, load MCX files into Active Directory if you extend your schema and have have Active Directory apply policies to Macs. 
using the, the um, Active Directory plugin on uh, in OS X, which the Active Directory plugin is is really well written, I think. Um, almost no Active Directory implementation is perfect, and so we see a lot of Macs falling off because there's an issue with you know, some some weird flag in some weird part of the forest, you know, but um, but overall it's it's pretty good. If it could do anything better, I would say it could be that it would be more forgiving to Active Directory if there's an issue with Active Directory. It feels like it's good enough for our production release when you, you know, as far as uh, hybrid, uh, you know, Windows, for, Windows and Mac OS. For, for heterogeneous and, or hybrid environments like that, we, we do a lot of, what, what we call the golden triangle, where we put an open directory server, an active directory server, we bind the two together. Um, and th that way, for authentication and authorization, they're using active directory, but then for password policies, they're using open directory. We try to do that if, if they're willing to extend their active directory schema. Otherwise, we'll just implement an open LDAP and maybe pull four or five records from that, something of that nature. And, and hope that they don't fall off. We, we see a lot of OS 10 servers when they're plugged into Active Directory networks that just fall off. They, and then you have to rebind, and in the process of rebinding, none of your clients are active. Right. You know, um, Apple has a big... Right, which, you know, in, in graphics environments, they, they'll, they'll start crying, you know, literally. I mean, graphic designers are, are like that. They cry at the drop of a hat. Yeah. <laughs> this must come from living in Santa Monica. <laughs> um, I live in Santa Monica, by the way. So, actually, I live in Hollywood now. But um, so um, DNS, you know, older ver um, you know, just to get back real quick before I move on to using it and and uh, Apple's selling OS 10 server from on the, their enterprise group is selling it pretty heavy to like companies like Disney and Universal as a replacement for Windows servers, um, and they're they're having really good sales, and then um, I sometimes contract with Apple Professional Services and go in and fix the issues that they've, they've left me with from a sales standpoint. And, you know, they don't support SMB signing as a file server, which is, or as a client to file servers, which is pretty huge. They also don't, yeah. <laughs> We're in the man in the middle room, right? I mean, yeah, exactly. Um, all Windows file servers, by default, ship with SMB signing turned on. And if you're in a Starbox type environment and you want to be able to share files from the Mac side to the Windows side, you have to get a third-party piece of software like Dave to do it. Um, if, if that one feature is, is required, if they would insert that, which they say they're going to do in Leopard, then that would remove the need for something like Dave for, for the most part. So, um, so DNS, same thing. Um, most packages that Apple has implemented in the OS X server do have DOS exploits, so that's, you know. But then again, what doesn't, right? Um, so <clears throat> um, this is kind of interesting. From a DHCP standpoint, LDAP, op open directory can be, settings can be configured to be sent to clients of the network. So clients will bind automatically to your open directory environment. So you could theoretically install DHCP on your laptop, go into an Apple environment, fire it up, and have people binding to your open directory server on your laptop. And therefore, you can implement MCX files against them, things of that nature. It's, it's kind of wild, the, uh, the options that, that, or the loopholes or whatever that they've thrown in there. But, um, but the, one of the ways to get around that is just to make sure that everything has SSL turned on, or uh, SSL turned on in the, in the OS. So. Um, <clears throat> firewall and NAT, they don't use IP tables, they don't use IP chains, they use IPFW, which is kind of cool but um, because it's really easy, but it's a little more limited. You can't block based on a MAC address of a client or something of that nature. Um, dummy net is, can be used to shape traffic. With open directory, you can have an open directory master and an open directory replica, kind of like having two um, active directory controllers. But um, your open directory master is always, because it's the password server, going to be the primary server that everybody logs into. So if you want to balance your traffic, you have to use something like DemiNet to do it, which can be kind of frustrating for people who don't know how to open a command line shell, you know, um, because that's only available through the command line. They do have, you know, the ability to, to build rules, but the rules are just for accept and deny. Um, and then they, they built this. I don't know why they actually bothered to deploy it because it doesn't really work right. 
but they, they built this S2S VPN program that is supposed to allow you to build site site VPNs, um, but it, it really doesn't work very well. Well, um, rather than have, I guess the idea was rather than have to, you know, install NAT on one server and install NAT on another and then bridge them, that you would just use s to VPN to automatically do all that. Why, why doesn't it work? Um, a, it doesn't support aggressive mode stuff, which is pretty typical amongst most routers, but B, it just doesn't, it, the, like, you give a hash key, you give another hash key, and it just doesn't bind. Like, so it doesn't work reliably. I've made it work, um, and I put it in my book, but I wish I'd have put a disclaimer saying, you know, that it doesn't really work reliably, which, which really in, in a deployment strategy means it doesn't work, right? So, um, but, but it's still there, and I have a feeling that in the next version they'll, they'll fix it. They do have a program called uh, the Gateway Setup Assistant, which will build NAT and all your, IP cha- all, um, all your IPFW.com stuff for you. Um, and the IPFW stuff that you can configure from the front, from the GUI, is definitely very limited compared to what you can do with ipfw.conf. So the, the configuration file can do a whole lot more than the GUI can, as in almost any case, right? Um, <clears throat> and then they wrote their own, uh, rather than deploy OpenVPN, they just wrote their own VPND that, um, that really has pretty limited support. This is the extent of their options for it. So if you want to do some, some pretty serious VPN stuff, you have to use um, OpenVPN, which has been compiled and is easily available through Darwin ports. And if you're running an OS X box and you're here, I'm guessing that you've heard of Darwin ports. But Darwin ports is just a collection of compiled software that works in Darwin that guys have contributed. So <clears throat> I, I'm personally a huge fan of Darwin ports. Um, so their FTP implementation is TNFTP. Has anyone here used that? Every user has to have a shell account, which um, which isn't true for all FTP software, of course. Um, I, I find this to be an incredible limitation because every user in the environment has has a shell, and you can use jails, but no one ever bothers. So, um, so in any OS 10 environment. Um, that's that's always kind of a pretty big issue, especially if you're running an anonymous FTP server because a couple little lines of code and someone can be sitting there at the root of your volume. They might not be able to change anything, but they have complete access. So, um, And then rather than use an FTP user's file, um, all the FTP usernames and passwords are stored in NetInfo. Of course, if guest is enabled, then that really doesn't help you very much. But... And I'm kind of doing this service by service. Is that cool or? Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, so QuickTime streaming. Um, has anyone here ever tried to intercept streams or do do anything like that? Not just for QuickTime, but for real. Like stuff? Right. Um, all that stuff is pretty freely available for QuickTime as well. Um, the one nice thing about about QuickTime is you can use a SSL with it, which can help to mitigate that as a risk. Um, <clears throat> real communications between two OS 10 servers running QuickTime streaming um, are all in clear text, so that's pretty easy to just sit there with a uh, <clears throat> with a hub and TCP dump and the rest is history. Um, and I, I haven't really given a lot of thought to different ways to, to attack QuickTime streaming servers. Um, a lot of my clients use it, and I'm kind of afraid that if I build something that it'll go bad on me. Um, so um, so for Net, NetBoot, um, <clears throat> NetBoot is a way to boot your Mac with T. If any of you have ever accidentally held the T key down, or uh, not T, but N, the N key down when you boot your computer, it just it, it has a little network logo where it's spinning and looking for a netboot image to boot off of. Um, netboot images have to be stored in either a TFTP server or an open AFP server, so no passwords, um, which means that you can easily download or boot off of anyone's volume if they're running um, if they're running netboot. And a lot of clients that I see actually have netboot open to the world, so. Even though it would be very, very slow, someone could easily um, boot off of their server, which, you know, 
is probably never a good idea. Um, you can use Open Directory to kind of mitigate that. So, that, you know, you have to have a username and password to actually log into the system, but, you know, it's still out there. Um, and you can also use File Vault with those to kind of make things a little more secure. Um, in the OS X world, File Vault is just an encrypted folder that all of your data from your slash users folder lets in. So. Um, don't try to put more than 100 nodes per Xserve on it. 100 nodes per Xserve? Yeah, I would definitely not do that. I mean, you know, 4 gigs of RAM, dual core, maybe, but otherwise definitely. If you have something to have, like, lots of read right to the drive, you think FireVault is a good idea? I use FileVault for everything. Um, the only time that I don't use FileVault is if there's an application incompatibility. So that it, it really doesn't seem to slow down performance um, because a lot of the stuff, like if you're in Photoshop, your you know, you know your your swap files for Photoshop are stored outside. So the most of the read and write stuff, um, Entourage works fine in File Vault. A lot of the Adobe products don't, and that's that's really you know pretty pretty heavily deployed in Mac environments. So um, I, I like File Vault a lot. I mean you know. I I don't think I have it turned on in this laptop because it, it it does seem to slow it down a little bit. But um, the the big my big problem with File Vault is that every now and then it wants to um, compact your File Vault image, you know, and then you're sitting there waiting for two hours and there's no cancel button on it. So you know it's like and then if you reboot it, it's automatically going to start doing it again. So um, that. Yeah, <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm not a big fan of that, personally. Um, so images must be stored on servers with no security. I kind of already mentioned that. Um, but, but I mean, in school environments, it's, I guess it's no big deal because what's a third grader going to do? But, you know, when you get to companies like, um, you, you have to, you, you just have to architect your, your network around that concept. Um, we were doing some work for, a government agency, um, <clears throat> and they couldn't have any disks, so they had to use file. Um, they had to use Netboot, but um, but they were physically segmented as to which image you could boot to. And Apple Talk is incredibly bad about hopping across VLANs. You know, um, we see it at big film studios all the time, where you may work for a company who's renting space, and you should be VLAN where you can't see anything else, but you do because there was an update two days ago to Rendezvous, and now it hops and does something new that's kind of weird. So, um, <clears throat> so multicast DNS is always fun to play with, but Rendezvous seems to go a little beyond that sometimes. Anyways. So um, forensic-specific stuff for Mac servers. Um, before you plug a drive in, um, it, Apples have um, disk arbitration D running in the background, so if you're going to try to do forensics on a drive, um, you should definitely either use a write blocker or um, rename this file right here. Oops. <laughs> to re rename this file right here to something um, like, you know, dot old, and then either reboot or kill your disk arbitration daemon, and that should that should make it not do that. Um, and then. You know, I, I guess last year at uh, at DEF CON there was someone giving a talk on secure channels and using secure channels to trade credit card information or something. Um, the, a couple Apple-specific file types, and I guess not Apple-specific anymore because iTunes is so widely spread now, but AAC files are, are uh, definitely have all the same fields that an MP3 file might, for example. Um, so, I mean, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not here to talk about forensics, but when when I have done work like that, it's like the second you plug in a drive to a Mac, it writes to it. So, that's that's never a that's never a good thing. Um, so, some of the tools that we use a lot, um, I mentioned Snort. Uh, I'll deploy Snort. Pretty, I, I probably deploy Snort at least once a week on Apple servers, just because no one else seems to. And like I said, it's really easy if you've got you can download Henwin off versiontracker.com. It takes about two minutes to install, and you've got a fully functional version of Snort. If you want to actually go further and just use Snort from the command line, then um, 
Darwin, um, Darwin Ports has it um, in it as well. And you can also actually CD into the Henwin.app. And it's, it's uh, located, I think, two or three subdirectories under that. So. And then in, in my book, and also I think on AFP 548, which is a big Mac website, I, I posted the checkboxes that work versus the checkboxes that don't and stuff like that. So, um, so anyways, I'm a big fan of that. Also, in Hinwin, they, they have the Guardian Perl script that automatically updates your IPFW file if someone is doing something to your system. So if someone's port scanning me, it supposedly will automatically update my IPFW.com file. Now you're installing this on your client side or your server side? Or both? Sometimes both. It's according to who it's for. Right. Um, it seems like a little too much control for standard client side stuff. Yeah, and you know, even on the server side, um, in an organization with 80 people and no IT staff, it's, you know, some of these snort options like the... Uh, the trading pornography feature that Snort has and stuff like that. Well, I'll usually disable those for clients because. You never know. Yeah, you know, I mean, a file called porn.doc might be a script about for a porn or, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> porn clients pay really well. I don't know if any of you have ever done work for them, but usually they'll pay IT anything. Work. <laughs> IT work specifically. I, I'm not the. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I, I had to do some work one time at a post house that st solely does porn. And if you've ever watched the same um, scene, <laughs> you know, 50 times in a row, you just feel gross, you know? Like, you're like, ah, oh, ah, oh, you hit her in the eye. You know, it's <laughs> terrible, terrible stuff. That's usually how I sound, too. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, they pay really well, so. And they want everything right then, so they have to. Um, so um, I use I use Checkmate sometimes for uh, for tripwire checksums, um, especially on servers on the workstation side. I don't I can't imagine really deploying that. You can um, automatically deploy tools using Apple Remote Desktop. Um, it'll automatically install package files, which Henwin is in a package-based installer. Um, so you can deploy this to 500 Macs at the same time, which is kind of nice because, you know, obviously we've always been able to do that with Microsoft servers and, you know, now with Linux you can do it as well. So it, it makes sense that Apple's kind of following that trend. Um, <clears throat> so Metasploit obviously has, I don't know, 15 exploits maybe for the Mac that you can run. Um, Nessus obviously works for OS X. <laughs> yeah, but you know, uh, for, for I, I, th I read an article um, I don't know six months ago where they said that out of the box OS X is by far the most secure operating system around, and I was like, well, obviously, like most media people, this was written by a Mac guy because out of the box, it's really uh, OS X workstation is is quite secure because they don't enable many of the services. I mentioned that in a minute. I, I actually give the link for it, um, the, it and it's the NSA. And yeah, what did they, say? <clears throat> um, they have a, a secure have a deployment down. strategy, so a lockdown strategy. Is this published? It's published. Yeah, Where at? Um, I'll yeah. give the link in just a minute. Gosh darn it! <laughs> so um, so I I feel really bad because I I did a I turned on all my services and I on a default server and I did a Nessa scan against it and it was about 50 pages. Um, but I didn't save the report properly, I guess, so I can't show it to you. But Nessus 3 is available for um, for OS 10 server and OS 10. Um, Darwin Ports is a great place to look for different updates um, for binaries, so you don't have to build them yourself. Um, everything from GD on. Um, I don't think I mentioned this. Yeah, I do. Um, so, and then by default, all logs are at low levels, but you can turn them up. And there's actually a program called console.app that gives you access to all the logs so you don't have to go hunting for them because none of them are in the right place. So, which is kind of frustrating sometimes. Console, yeah, it's, it's just under applications utilities. So it's called okay. console, yeah. Um, so some, some Apple kind of specific utilities that we use, um, Rendezvous Browser, um, 
I think I have it running right here. Bonjour browser, I guess. Um, I can look at kind of, you know, automatically it's just going to go out and tell me um, what services are open on different people's computers. So, you know, who else has OS X server running? Ishikawa? Anybody? Sweet. <laughs> I don't see many people with OS X server running on their iBooks. It's, I mean, you know, it, it's very, very rare. Um, oh, and you have, so, also, there's a there's a totally awesome exploit for Xan. Yeah. Um, I've been waiting for a while. Um, and then you know by default any Xan if you if you have Xan installed and you fiber in you can see the root of of everything and you bypass all quotas just by going through your metadata which is pretty fun. <laughs> Anyways, um, so I don't really go into that because I, I actually have a, another another thing I I did on that. But um, but so Bonjour browser is kind of cool to just see what everyone's running on a network really quick. Um, secure empty trash. Someone had mentioned earlier in one of the forensics talks, I think, writing data 20 times, you know, writing zeros or random arbitrary numbers. They just write zeros over it 20 times, which you know, whatever. But um, any when you go to secure empty trash, any of those files, they just overwrite that that IP or uh, those blocks 20 times. So um, file vault obviously can slow down performance. Personally, I don't do anything that requires a lot of performance. I do most of my work in terminal. Um, so so for me, the performance really doesn't matter. If I'm writing, I'll use um, I'll use another machine basically. So that's that's a side. File vault. File vault. It, it takes your your in Mac OS 10, your users file, your users folder, and it turns it into a, an encrypted disk image. So, I'll, I'm sorry. DFS. Um, it's, yeah, it's it's like EFS plus. I, it's a, I I can't remember the. I don't know what the file. I think it's the same as the regular. It's, still, it's, um, it's just an encrypted DMG. And, and but they keep writing. Right. It over and it's encrypted with I think AS256. Um, but it's it's pretty pretty uh you know and it obviously the bigger it gets the the more uh issues you might have so they just change it into a disk image file <laughs> right and then they mount it and write to it when you boot they mount it and write to it personally at home the machine that i i write um that i use for writing and you know for all my prawn um i i actually have use a concatenated raid on it so to turn the machine on you actually have to insert my USB jump drive that I keep with me all the time. So, you know, there, uh, I mean, you can actually get pretty, pretty crazy. And on that machine, File Vault's enabled, and all, all the Word documents that later become my books are in those, those folders. So, um, so Fink Commander. Um, Fink Commander will go through its, and install all the, full, all the programs. Like, if you're trying to install GD lib or something, it'll do, download it, install it, and install and download all of its dependencies, which is kind of cool. Um, so it's kind of like the ability to to deploy, you know, one package without having to go through all the problems that most Mac users can't kind of figure out. Um, Squid Squidman is, um, you know, if the, if there's not a front end for it, chances are most Mac um, shops aren't going to deploy it. Um, so Squidman's a front end for being able to deploy a proxy. The proxy built into Mac OS X server is just crap. So you know, um, Squidman is maybe two years old since its last update, and I asked the guy who wrote it if I could have a source code, and then I'd just update it for him, and he he didn't want to let go of it. So, um, but uh, but it, it is still a pretty decent app. So um, I wish it would do IMAP S, but that's aside from the point. Um, <clears throat> so the concatenated RAID thing I already mentioned. Um, GPG and PGP are both available for for Apple products. Um, GPG is integrated straight into mail.app. I would open my mail.app, but I think someone here is going to take my password, and that would suck. But it's just same as anything, drop-down list, check, you know. Um, Lingon, one, one weird thing about OS X server or OS X workstation is they deprecated cron. Apple just didn't, they, they just couldn't work within the confines of cron anymore, I guess, because they wanted more Windows-style service offerings. So, what they gave us was Launch D, which no Apple administrator that I know of, other than maybe four of us, have been able to actually figure out how to use efficiently. So um, one of the guys actually built this program called Lingon, which um, which allows you. It's basically like opening the services 
box in a Windows server. Um, so you can start, stop, um, and add or remove new services from a GUI. Um, and LaunchD, how many people here have used LaunchD? Yeah, it's kind of a pain. I mean, you can re-enable cron on an OS X box, but like it, Apple's trying to get away from it, and every update that you run is going to blow out your update and stuff like that. And um, one, another thing about when you update software in an OS X environment, you never know what effects that's going to have on the GUI. So for clients, when they want me to update them to, let's say they're failing a Nessus scan because by default OS X server uses... Um, think open SSL 097B or something. Um, so in some cases, rather than actually updating open SSL, because when I tried, it would blow out the GUI, and that was the client's requirement that they had to maintain their GUI, I would just change the headers for it, and then it would pass the Nessa scan. So, um, so GUI tools um, Mac users love, and, and I don't think they're going to use anything without it. Like, there's a, there's a UMasks, um, you know, what, that define how new files that you create or have their permissions and what attributes that different things you do as a user have. Um, there's there's actually a GUI app for that, for creating UMasks and stuff like that. So they, they get, you know, like like I showed, even even CHMod has has a GUI an an OS ten, which is kind of kind of wild. Um, so what's next? Oh, more information. Okay, so this is the link to that um, that NSA white paper. Um, for anyone who asked about it, I think John asked about it. Um, so there's the link right there. Um, and I, I, I emailed this to Noid last night, so he's got the updated copy of my presentation. It's only missing one screen. I can't remember which one it is. Um, but I'm sure it's one that doesn't matter. Um, It's a it's a good year and a half old almost, but but at the same and I think it was written for 10.3, so it might not include Launch D, um, but it, it does offer some pretty basic guidelines and pretty pretty good things to do. I mean, you know, if if you're deploying OS 10 as a as a specific type of server like a LDAP server or a web server, it doesn't really cover that as much as maybe it could. Um, I think I'm gonna. I'm, one of the next books I'm gonna write is OS 10 security, and I'll probably, you know, reference some of their material What's frequently. The yeah. The I didn't know that, and I just affirmative yes it. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to specify that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I, I, <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't want to pretend I know something. Um, AFP 548 is a great website for OS 10 server stuff. Um, Xsanity is a pretty decent site for Xsan stuff. Um, I've got, they've got a pretty big backlog of articles. I've got like four articles that I wrote for them that haven't been published yet. So they're, you know, they're, they're not uh, as up to date as maybe they could be. But um, Secure Mac, Mac Security. Um, you know, sans.org has, I think, eight Mac-specific articles up there. Um, so there's, there's plenty of other information, um, although not as much as you might think. So, so anyways, that's it. Q&A. Unless, wait, do you want me to go back? Were you still writing? Yeah, I'll totally leave that up there. So Q&A. Everyone's just tired of layer one and wants to go home now. I can dig that. <laughs> so... Yeah. What other books do you have in the works that you're working on? Um, I'm about to wrap up a book on PHP and Perl programming. And my next book is, after that, is going to be on Windows Server 2007 or whatever they freaking call it. Um, 2010, I don't know. Um, and then after that, I, I think the OS X security book, probably with O'Reilly, you know. And other than that, I'm open, you know. <laughs> I'd love to actually do more contributing to books than writing books because it, it it doesn't really pay that well, and you know, over the long run, you know, just to contribute something to me seems better, you know. You had a question? I was gonna say when you go out and do, uh, like for instance, uh, these updates, like you're saying those ROM updates that blew up uh, VLAN, uh, you know, you know, integration over Rendezvous and things like that. Are you 
Do you have like a lab of some sort that you're testing these things in before you? Oh, I I personally test everything. But, but I mean, I mean you personally have like a setup like in your office that you just set, you just test out everything there is beforehand, or is it per project base? How do you do that? Both, a little bit of both. I have 24 machines at home, um, and that's that's where I do a lot of my testing. And then at my office, I've got another maybe 20. And and so for the office stuff, you know, I'll I'll usually like if there's 10, 4, 6 update, you know, I'll have someone else in my in my company do those. Right, but I mean, somebody will do the updates, but you, you don't specifically know that it's breaking that specific configuration until you're actually going to use it. What I what I usually do is I'll uh, I'll run a tripwire before, and then I'll run a tripwire after, and then I'll look at everything that changed. Did you change con change review? Yeah. So um, so I mean that that's just the way I do it. I'm sure that there's better ways. You know, if anyone can think you know can mention any, please. But um, but I'll. I'll also try to try to install it, and then I'll make sure that like I can install FTP into it from Windows. Make sure I install FTP into it from or SMB into it from whatever OS, right. you know. And a lot of times they're really clear. They they do document some of their files pretty well. Ever since all this plist file conversion stuff, they really aren't documenting stuff like they used to. Are, are not. Are not. Um, and then a collection of people at AFP 548 have actually started um, doing kind of, since Apple doesn't provide knowledge bases on what they updated, um, AFP 548 is actually starting to review everything that they update and then, you know, say, okay, well, they updated these lines in this file and it has this. John? Do you have a plist file editor? Yeah, there's, there's one. Yeah, if you go to version tracker and just look for plist editor, I think there's like four or five of them now. I'm sorry? Oh, there is. Yeah, I just use I, I just use terminal for it, but you know, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's just XML exactly. So as long as you're, you know, yeah, yeah, and the, I mean, there's a lot of GUI tools for like K destroy, so that you can um, destroy Kerberos tickets. I mean, there's all kinds of GUI tools for every imaginable thing on the Apple side. They're they're pretty pretty good about making GUI tools for things. Third party? <laughs> um, you mean as a client or as a server? Both. Well, actually as a client. As a client? Cisco. And, and um, as of 10.4.6, they built in the Cisco IPsec um, into, huh? There's native IPsec, Cisco and native IPsec. Yeah, and uh, I, did I update to 10.4.6 yet on this machine? Um, and yeah, in 10.4.6, and um, no, I didn't. Um, and Internet Connect, they. Well, you do straight IPsec now, not HTTP or LTP. Right, you, yeah. Yeah, and I. Yeah. I'm waiting for that. Open VPN. Yeah. <laughs> so now you don't have to buy, now you don't have to buy Digitunnel or whatever yeah. you were using before. Yeah. You know, yeah. Does uh, Mac OS X support any SSL? Um, they, I mean, on the GUI side, or just straight, like. From the GUI side, I don't think so. From the terminal side, if you can get it to build on BSD, you know, I'm I'm sure they can. I haven't tried that specifically. None of my clients actually actually use that that I know of. Sometimes they do things without telling me, though. What's yeah. the price on this? Is going to be um, however much the router is. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's free. Yeah. It's free for the client. Right. And will it work with other systems other than Mac, like OpenBSD? I I yeah. I mean, if if. If you can get it to build, you know, in OpenVPN, you can use almost anything. But, um, but you know, and it definitely works in Windows. But, but you know, you need a Cisco device to to do it, either running, you know, without NAT or with NAT, you know. So either as as just a VPN server, or as as your firewall with VPN. My final slide. My crappy credentials and whatnot. <coughs> So, and at, at our company, we do a lot of a lot of Mac audits. That's kind of become one of our things, and regrettably, a little bit of actual Mac forensic work. But 
Forensic work, I don't know, if, who here has done forensic work of any kind? It's, it, that's pretty fun, isn't it? You just always feel like you're going to screw something up. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everything with Mac stuff kind of is, is kind of weird. It's according to what city you're in and what, what industry you're targeting. Like, if you're working specifically with print shops, like, we don't take on new print shops as clients anymore because they just don't, don't pay well. But if you're, if you're working with, um, anyone here work for Universal Studios or... If, if you're working for Universal or Disney or someone like that, then they usually pay pretty well. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> or, but he works for them, right? Not as a contractor, I guess. He's an employee. Yeah, they don't. No one in the film industry pays employees anything. I mean, even if you're even if you're a staff like um, director, you're not going to get paid crap. But if you're a freelancer, then you know you get to make kind of, you know, in the in the entertainment industry at least. I don't know. Which I, I think comes from just the fact that everything has to be done right then, you know. So, anyways, any other questions? No love on the questions. I should have brought more swag, right? Yes. <laughs> um, I just want to say that your talk was awesome. You did the talk from, yeah. <laughs> so, and and also I got to give give it up to all the guys at Layer One. This has been probably one of the most highly technical conferences that I've. I've this is the best year by far. Uh, yeah, totally. So. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it. Thanks, guys. Oh, <laughs> thanks. Hi. I have a VPN mm -hmm. in my Open BSD box, which is on a nice high-speed code. Cool. Want to thank you guys for coming. Out. And then I want to be able to then access. Want to thank you guys for coming out to Layer One 2006. Through a VPN. And, uh, I agree. Like, I would need this extra hardware on my laptop. Been. <laughs> no, no, no. Last the client year was good. This year is all you need. Hook, so. I just need a client yeah. software. Um, right? Yeah, and so if, you're we've got some gear if you're running open VPN, if you're running, VPN, if you're running uh, BSD stations, without, uh, some like, weird if you're not running a Mac, equipment. you're yeah. just running straight open that BSD, you'll probably just use open VPN. Open VPN. Right, what I would do is just go to Cisco. Like, what, uh, what kind of device are you connecting to on the other side? And we were looking at them last night. It looks like you could actually just use them as a PC. Also, um, on your way out, at the bottom of a box, I found a bunch of 30% off coupons for O'Reilly books. So uh, fill out a uh, attendee feedback form, grab yourself a 30% off coupon, and uh, we look forward to seeing you guys next year. We'll definitely be doing another one. So.